Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday, September 25th, 2019, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, Placer County Airport Land Use Commission, and Western Placer County Consolidated Transportation Services Agency. Will you please join me in the salute to our flags? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the clerk be kind enough to call the roll? Here. Here. Joiner. Here. Mackey. Here. Euler. Wright. Here. Okay, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will not be going into closed session. Uh, did you want to make any comments about? No, right? sir. No comments. Okay. No closed session. Um, we will move to uh, item D: the approval of action minutes for August twenty eighth, twenty nineteen. Anything on the minutes that need to be addressed? Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, approve the minutes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion is passed. Agenda review. Anything on the agenda that anybody wants to remove for discussion? Anyone else? Uh, well, we're going to discuss it anyhow. So. <laughs> All righty. We'll take that as a yes. Uh, now is the time for public comment. Um, Anyone in the audience that wishes to address the, the Airport Land Use Commission, Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, or the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation? Uh, Lee Bastian, Chair of the Municipal oh. Advisory Council. Just a couple of information items. First off, Bishop Pumpkin Farm in Wheatland is now open. And they are open for six weeks. And they're expecting over 100,000 visitors in that time. and. Traffic backs up all the way to, to Riosa Road on the October weekends. So if you're heading that way, be careful because it backs, because the left turn lane is only three cars long and then it backs up onto the main, main thoroughfare. The second item is I have had, recently had a couple of vis visits to Roseville and I was leaving Roseville at six o'clock on Friday nights getting on Highway 65 northbound at Pleasant Grove, and we were stop and go all the way to Sunset. So I just wanted to share that information with the board. Thank, Thank you. you. We're, we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else under public comment for the uh, items? All right, seeing none, uh, we will now move to item G, the consent calendar for the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. These items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They'll be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Is there anyone that wishes to address anything uh, from the board on the consent? Anyone in the audience? All right, I'll ask uh, for uh, approval. For approval of uh, consent items one through six. It's been moved Second. and seconded to move the consent calendar for the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Now we will move to the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency Airport Land Use Commission. Is that right? Yeah. Am I going? How am I doing? Okay. <laughs> and the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency. Uh, this is, uh, is this a consent? It's an action item. Uh, this is a public, public hearing, hearing item. Yes. The public hearing item. Okay, I was a little confused here. Sorry. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, these other items are on the top there. Are, can, we're all passed. Okay, this is a public hearing for the Placer County Winery Farm Brewery, Brewery Ordinance Zoning Tax Amendments Consistency Determination. Pre, uh, uh, staff presentation by David Milk. Uh, good morning, members of uh, the Airport Land Use Commission. Uh, today we have uh, before us the Placer County Winery and Farm Brewery zoning text amendments uh, and we're seeking a consistency determination from the Airport Land Use Commission. So we're asking you to conduct a public hearing 
today regarding the consistency determination and bottom line is that we're recommending that you find that the zoning um, uh, text amendments uh, for the winery and farm brewery are consistent subject to uh, parcels located in compatibility zones A and B1 meet the ALUC airport land use uh, compatibility plan requirements. So there's a lengthy staff report. There's a summary of the zoning um, text amendments provided as attachment A. There, there are some maps, and we have a PowerPoint that summarizes all of this for the benefit of the board and for the benefit of the public. So yeah. um, just by way of background, uh, your role is to, uh, one, adopt an airport land use compatibility plan. That was done in 2014, which was an update of the plan that was done in two, the year 2000. And your um, second primary role is to review uh, plans, zoning, uh, ordinance regulations, building regulations near airports. Uh, basically, anything that falls within uh, that circle area there is subject to Airport Land Use Commission review. Um, you today have three um, possible determinations with respect to the zoning text amendments. One is to find it consistent. Uh, one is the second one is to find find it consistent subject uh, to conditions, which is uh, uh, today's staff recommendation, or to determine it's inconsistent based upon specific conflicts. So the zoning text amendment um, the overview here, there's 10 key provisions in the zoning text amendments for the winery and farm brewery ordinance. Uh, as I mentioned, there's an attachment A that summarizes it in a little bit more detail. Uh, the two highlighted items here are the focus of the commission, uh, where the uh, second item there talks about redefining the term events and also creating a, a table outlining special event allowances uh, for and defining the maximum capacity of guests. So why do we focus on events? Well, events attract people, and people on the ground are, can be of concern depending upon which particular compatibility zone that they are located in and the proximity to the airport. Um, this is the other uh, five um, parts of the uh, zoning text amendment overview. So. Is a graphic here provided by Placer County Planning Department that shows the typical events and the allowable event sizes. So we have two types of events here that are being uh, redefined. You have promotional events, uh, which uh, direct for less than 50 attendees at one time, and then special um, events where more than 50 attendees can occur at one time. And of course, there are examples provided in each column. It's the special events that are a particular concern, uh, particularly for compatibility zones A and B1, because having someone having more than 50, uh, up to 150 to 200, could uh, result in a conflict depending upon where the winery, farm brewery is located in proximity to the airport. Uh, this is the project area. This map also is provided by Placer County. Um, and the focus, while the, the zoning text amendments is countywide, the focus is basically on the west central portion of Placer County. Uh, there are approximately 16 wineries shown on this map. And over the long term, uh, the county staff anticipate that future wineries will most likely locate within this uh, particular region of Placer County. That's why uh, in the staff report, we indicate that we focus on the Auburn and the Lincoln uh, airports uh, versus the Blue Canyon Airport. So timeline here. So the county uh, began this process releasing a notice of preparation back in October 2017, and then they released a, a, e a draft EIR uh, April of uh, this year, and it was closed out in June 2019. Uh, they submitted their zoning text amendments to us in September, and today we're here at the public hearing. Um, so when we do the consistency review, um, just as a refresher here, um, there's four uh, basically factors that we look at. So it's noise, safety, airspace protection, and overflight uh, compatibility. And so this map here kind of gives an overview of uh, uh, areas that are zoned that would allow for winery and farm brewery um, zoning and with the compatibility zones over, overlaid on top of the, uh, the airports. It's kind of a difficult map to, uh, to read, so we focus in on Auburn Airport. 
And so uh, in Auburn Airport here, you will notice that in particularly the B1 zone, um, there are some parcels, uh, residential agricultural parcels that uh, may actually um, uh, have uh, the opportunity to have winery and farm brewery uh, operations and as such could have special events. And so that's one of the reasons why that we uh, recommend a restriction in the B1 zone. Uh, likewise with Lincoln, there's also um, areas zoned for greater than 10 acres, um, proximity to uh, the airport in the B1 zone. It's hard to see, but there's a little bit of the uh, A zone. Actually, uh, it's where the B2 uh, uh, identifier is uh, underneath that is uh, part of the A zone. So bottom line, uh, and it was, this is more detailed in the staff report, um, in terms of the four-factor evaluation, uh, we conclude that the zoning text amendments are consistent subject to meeting the airport land use compatibility uh, safety requirements. Safety requirements are the same both for Auburn and Lincoln airports, so there isn't, you know, like we have different here and different there. Uh, in zone A, uses having events are not allowed. I mean, basically, zone A, there's very little that can, that can be accomplished uh, in, on parcels um, that have that designation. Uh, zone B1 uh, uses having a special events, and if you recall back pre several slides, that was the column that showed where you could have more than 50 people, up to 200 people. So uh, you would need to um, meet the single acre intensity requirements for that particular compatibility zone. And underneath there, Auburn, the limit is 80 people per acre, and for Lincoln, it's 120 uh, people per acre. So with that, we recommend that you find that the zoning text amendments are consistent subject to parcels in compatibility zones A and B1 meet the airport land use compatibility requirements. So that would mean that any particular um, special event that went forward, in particular zone B1, since they're not allowed in zone A, would need to meet those uh, intensity requirements for Auburn and um, Lincoln airports. With that, we recommend that you conduct the public hearing and then make a consistency determination. And lastly, okay. I'd always be glad to answer any questions. And I would like to note that uh, Nikki Stregan from Placer County Planning uh, Division is here today. Um, she is the lead on the zoning text amendments for this particular ordinance. All righty, thank you, Mr. Melko. Uh, does uh, before I open up the public hearing, does any council, any members have a question or quick question? If I can find the button. There you go. There we go. Let me switch um, it. So David, talk to me about intensities for a moment. You say Lincoln's is 120 per acre. We're talking about 10 acre minimums for future right. wineries within that. So that intensity, the, the overall property is 10 acres. We've got 120. Well, so you have two per acre. Can you consolidate that across the 10 acres and? So um, if you go back to that slide. I saw the 200. Right, limit. yeah. So it's the single acre. So on a, on a, on a particular, depending upon um, the land use, the zoning designation and the land use classification and the airport land use compatibility plan, generally these parcels will allow up to 100 people on average over um, the uh, the site, and so on a ten acre parcel, you could have up to a thousand people. The, the, but normally, when you look at a uh, an agricultural operation with a winery and a farm brewery, you know you've got fields of grapes or yeah. hops or whatever, and so the the special event's going to be clustered around the particular building, right. and so it's the single acre that we look at in this particular instance, and so. On these types of uses, the single acre is limited to those those amounts, and so um, you need to meet both in order to be uh, considered consistent. And the way that they have the special event allowance for um, up to 200 people, you know, you, that would be inconsistent on a particular parcel. And so um, it's the single acre that we focus on here because that's where the congregation of people would be. That was a little bit um, maybe 
convoluted. Hopefully you understood that. Um, I did. Yes. Bear with me. I didn't have any coffee this morning because I didn't have any power. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I've got an extra I just, Dr. Pepper if you want it. Yeah, I just got some here now. So, um, so hopefully that was it, that does help. Okay, um, I, I was I was curious about clustering whether it could be done uh, to create a, a larger event or not. You, you, so you, you know, the clustering is allowed within the plan, but once again, it can't exceed the the cap for the, the single acre, and yeah. so. This, um, All right, that's it. Okay, any other questions? From board members. Yeah, they do. Oh, yes. so David. Uh, I go ahead. I, I defer. No, 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 go ahead. Um, so, explain to me. I must have just missed it somewhere. Zone A events. Events are smaller than special events. Why are Zone A events not allowed? Well, so Zone A. Um, we have to go. I'll go back. And, um, let's take Auburn Airport here. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at that map and see where Zone A, it's right in the middle of the map. Zone A is like on both ends of the airport. And so at the end of the runways. It, in um, FAA uh, parlance, it typically involves the runway protection zone. And so you don't want to really put anything in Zone A uh, because planes are landing and taking off. And so you don't want to have people there because sometimes that's yeah, where yeah. accidents occur. Yeah. So we're only looking at this in the context of uh, the Airport Land Use Commission. Right. But you could have an air show. That that is not. Yeah. Right. Not right. There are there are there are there are exemptions within the Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan that allow for those single types of events. Yeah. Um, no, th thank you. And and what I was focused on was the previous slide that had the number of people that could be at an event, or that was an agricultural event. So. Yeah. All right. Good. Any other questions? Okay. All right. I'll now I'll open up the public hearing. And if anybody wants to address the council or the board or whatever we are <laughs> on this item. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Some quick comments. My name is Nikki Stregan. I'm the project planner from Placer County. Just want to thank um, David for working with us on on his analysis. Um, concur with the analysis. We have some processes in place with regard to discretionary. Um, review when um, in the RA zone district use permits are required so applying conditions in that circumstance and then of course during the building permit review process or business license review process there are um, some processes in place to conditionally allow or disallow certain activities so I want to thank you for that and uh, can you tell us when this is going to go to work to the Planning Commission is that in yes so the item will go to the Planning Commission um, our go goal is by the end of the year Okay. Uh, so our, our timeline was to have the commission look at it uh, this fall and then the board over the winter. And are there any more workshops today? Uh, there are not. This is actually one of our last stakeholder yeah. meetings. It's been to all the municipal advisory yes. councils. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Marilyn. Good morning. Marilyn Jasper speaking on behalf of Public Interest Coalition and the Sierra Club. I've had my coffee, but it hasn't kicked in. Oh. Um, I, I just want to bring a little bit more information as to what was presented. Um, I think I heard that the special events are of concern. However, the ag pro promotional events, which are under 50, kicker words at any one time, are unlimited. Uh, forget enforcement for right now, but there is no way to enforce less than 50 people on a rolling basis. If my winery or brewery is open from, on, I'll take Friday and Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., 12 hours, and I can have rolling events every hour, every two hours, whatever, the number of people who are gonna be there is undeterminable unless you had somebody monitoring it. I mean, you could have 50 an hour. Um, so th that is one problem. Um, the other is the, there is no, I, I need to cl get clarification on this. I believe there is no limit on the special events if they're private. So if, in other words, I'm not having a pro promotional event. I'm having a private party. So 
How are you going to define a private party? I have one friend who's in that party, so I'm making a. I'm going to call it private. The, I, I think that I, I realize this is airport consistency, but I think there are a lot of nuances in this or this proposed ordinance that have to be tied. The loose ends and the loopholes have to be tied up. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Well, is there any other? Comments before I close the public hearing. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board for action. Any more questions for staff? Seeing none, all right, I will entertain a motion. I'll move to approval of the item. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the Placer County Wine, Winery and Farm Brewery Ordinance Zoning Text Amendment Consistency Determination. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. The item is moved. And now we'll have the uh, item I, uh, 9 o'clock a.m. public workshop, the draft Placer County Regional Transportation Plan and Environmental Impact Report. Uh, Aaron Hort. Thank you, and good morning, Chair and uh, Board of Directors. So this morning I'm going to give you uh, hopefully what is a Reader's Digest version or a cliff notes of our larger regional transportation plan. There's some good information in here, but I'm going to try to summarize it in maybe uh, 10 minutes here. So last month we released the draft regional transportation plan uh, for uh, your review and the public's review after working for about a year and a half uh, with both your staff and SACOG staff on the development of both the Placer County Regional Transportation Plan and SACOG's Metropolitan uh, Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. The RTP represents our 20-year vision on how we'll respond to existing congestion and traffic issues and improve mobility throughout the county as we continue to grow. The plan is really a bottoms-up approach. It takes all of our circulation elements throughout the county. It takes our bicycle master plans, if we have pedestrian master plans, various transportation studies to build up and look at what is our transportation network needs for the future. Aside from being statutorily required to update the plan every five years, it's a good opportunity to reflect back on what are our priorities in terms of transportation projects, has any land use patterns changed, um, and also what goals um, and objectives do we want to um, update given our ever-changing landscape that we live in. But there's really two significant items that come out of the Regional Transportation Plan. One is it's our locally developed and approved uh, plan that gets incorporated into SACOG's MTP SES. And the second point is that all the projects contained in our Regional Transportation Plan are then eligible for both federal and state funding. Um, I, I failed to mention after getting into that that there's a, a few, um, uh, just as an overview, we're going to look at the plan itself. I'm going to try to frame it out. Um, and then what are the outcomes from the plan and developing uh, all these transportation projects? And then how does these projects impact uh, our environment? And then I'll wrap up with what our next steps as we wrap up this uh, regional transportation plan. But as we all know, uh, Placer County has been very attractive. Uh, it's been attractive for families, businesses. We have great schools. Um, with that does come traffic and transportation issues. Um, Within the sixth county region, we anticipate about 600,000 more residents by 2040. That'll bring us up to about 2.9 million, almost 3 million people within the sixth county region. And the reason why I'm starting it at such a high level is our transportation systems are interconnected. We have about a third of our population that leaves every morning to go work in Sacramento County. Uh, there's probably another 20% of residents who go elsewhere uh, to other counties. And then we also attract employees. So when we're looking at transportation, it's not just isolated within Placer County itself. Um, in Placer County, we anticipate another 54,000 new homes to be built that will accommodate 140,000 new residents. Um, and with that, 61,000 uh, new employees by 2040. As I mentioned, uh, the policy element is also an opportune time to look at what are our goals, policies, and objectives. Um, we have a very uh, diverse county from the suburban areas here in South Placer as we go up through the foothills, it transitions to agritourism and recreational tourism and the uh, eastern portions of the county's very different and dynamic um, issues that we have to address in all these different portions. So some of our goals and policies that we include within the plan uh, look at how do we improve on our transportation system? How can we make it more efficient? 
How can we facilitate the recreational traffic that comes through on a Friday night and leaves on a Sunday? Um, what projects can we um, look at to improve our passenger rail system, transit system, um, and provide a safer, more efficient roadway system? And to deliver all these, and to live up to these goals and objectives, uh, we have to be able to deliver our projects. And we deliver our projects through a financially constrained plan. We have to identify through this plan all the funding that is reasonably available. Um, in current dollars, we anticipate through the next 20 years about 6.9 billion will be available. Um, that translates into about 10.3 billion in years of expenditure, so it accounts for inflation. Um, through these revenue estimates, we look at both what are our historical trends um, and what changes may be coming. Um, federal funding has uh, declined over the last few years. At, at one point in time, we assumed federal funding would continue to increase about 4% annually. That's slowed to maybe around 2%. So that represents a much smaller pie, a piece of the pie than in the past. State funding is up from our prior plan, um, largely due to Senate Bill 1, a uh, funding influx that comes back to our local agencies through local streets and roads program for maintenance and through the various competitive programs that the state is, uh, has put out. Um, but the largest amount stays within our locally controlled sources. That's sales, existing sales taxes, that is gas taxes that come back to our county, and development fees uh, that are in place to help fund regional projects um, local projects, and that totals about 71% uh, of the pot. Also included within a revenue estimate is a South County sales tax district within the cities of Roseville, Rockland, Lincoln, and Loomis at this point in time. That translates to about 14% of the total of um, this overall larger pot of 71% that we have control and can determine how those monies are spent. Those projects are anticipated to be spent on a wide range of projects uh, from our circulation elements, as I mentioned, our studies. And we'll, we anticipate spending about 18% of that on the, our roadway and highway network system. So that's looking at Highway 65 widening. That's looking at completing the rest of 8065 interchange. That's look at, um, looking at widening um, State Route 193 or McBean Parkway within the city of Lincoln. A lot of capacity type projects is what we're talking about there. Um, a large portion though goes back into maintaining what we have today. Being able to maintain those roadways, the pavement quality, um, sidewalks, etc. cetera. Um, transit operations and capital represent about 22% of the overall pot. Um, that goes towards funding the existing transit services today and the future of our transit services looking at the expansion of capital corridor trains up to 10 uh, round trips per day and bus rapid transit uh, services proposed in the western portion of the county um, as those developments are built. We have um, seen a lot of successes with our active transportation plan in the last few years with the active transportation program at the state level. We can look to Colfax, we can look to Loomis, Auburn, who've all pulled in state monies to fund bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, we've also had a number of local bicycle master plans that have been updated recently, and we will continue to pull these monies in from the state level uh, to help fund and expand our, our active transportation system for whether it's recreation or for utility purposes. Um, and the final category here is systems management, operations, ITS. Essentially, how are we making our roadway network more efficient? Um, by either looking at turn lanes at intersections, ramp meters at, uh, on ramps, how are we conf fixing the existing configurations of our roadway system, tying in um, intelligent transportation systems so uh, transit traffic signals are talking to each other, and then as we go on to the future, who knows what that really has in store with you know, connected vehicles. So a lot of funds are being put back into the overall efficiency of our system. Public outreach, um, the plan started off with looking at whatever, what was our past public input we received um, and starting with that. But we've also been able to verify our past efforts and what we've heard from the public through um, a variety of funding strategy presentations, uh, pop-up workshop at Sierra College, two elected official workshops, and three online surveys that generated a little over 2,300 uh, participants in all of our outreach. And what we took away from all that outreach is that congestion is still the top issue. We have to deal with the congestion on our roadways. Um, fixing the freeways is right up there. Um, and transportation is, funding is confusing. I think even for us with all the different programs, 
where's the money coming from, how do we find it, and uh, I think working all together, being on top of those funding programs and uh, tirelessly looking for new funding sources will help us get to the end goal. And I think the last uh, piece of that takeaway is that online surveys work. We've generated way more interest and participation in this plan than we ever have in our regional transportation plan. So I'm going to trans transition now to the outcome. So what are we getting uh, for this investment por portfolio? Um, we'll talk about congestion reduction first. Um, we'll see, and the next series of slides are all comparing today versus the future. So we anticipate a reduction in congested vehicle miles traveled of about 18%. So what does that mean? Really, that's a planner's term, congested vehicle miles traveled, for how much, time, or how much travel is occurring in congested conditions. Basically, when the roadway or the highway is at capacity. How much are we traveling in that time period? So we anticipate a reduction with these improvements of 18%. Our congested lane miles on goods movement corridors, those are all the the highways and the local roadways that are designated as truck traffic routes um, would reduce by 9%. So there's a correlation between what we're doing for capacity purposes for um, our everyday commutes as well as for goods movement. We'll also be spending a little bit less time in um, delay, so the less it will take us, uh, we will be able to get to our destinations quicker, spending less time um, being delayed on the roadways. Um, however, our average travel speed will decline a little bit. So we would anticipate with these various improvements that our travel speeds on roadways will be a little quicker. That is not the case given the congestion um, that we still have today and things we'll have to wrestle with in the future. Transit options is another category. I mentioned that we're investing about 22% of the portfolio into future transit. Um, the increases we anticipate are partially due to new services that will be rolled out. I mentioned earlier, capital corridor expansion of round, the number of round trips, bus rapid transit in the um, western portion of the county, but it's also the proximity of where these services are to where people work and where people live. We anticipate that the ridership will increase about 185%. So let's pull it back into kind of some numbers here. That's about roughly 4,000 or so passengers on a daily basis today. That would go up to around 12,000 or so in the future when we have these additional services that are much more efficient and much more frequent. Um, with those closer proximity to uh, the housing and jobs, we anticipate about 41% more households be within a half mile of transit, which then allows the opportunity to bike or to walk there, and 31% within proximity to all of our job centers. Active transportation, um, I mentioned the number of plans that we have and the investment that we've seen through the active transportation plan and hopes that we will continue to be successful as we have been in this first four years of the ATP program. Um, with that, we anticipate an increase in 30% of the number of bikeways that we have in Placer County. Um, Roseville has done a great job at delivering their Dry Creek um, Greenway Trail. I know that in the eastern portion of the county, you have the Martis Valley Trail and uh, State Route 89 from um, Squaw Creek down into uh, to Truckee. So there's a number of these big, large uh, trails that we have on the books, um, but it's also adding in class two bike lanes to various roadways throughout the town when we have the ability. Um, and the last metric that I'm gonna discuss here that really kind of pulls everything together and looks at how we're performing on a broad basis is vehicle miles traveled. That's essentially how many miles is everybody traveling throughout the county. Um, we anticipate that our vehicle miles traveled will increase by about 27% as we move out to 2040, and that's really just a function of growth. If we add one more household, we're gonna add two more cars. Those two more cars are going to drive throughout the county to their various destinations. Um, a more meaningful metric, though, is to break it down on a population's basis, on a per capita. So when we look at that per capita, we can see the green line will slowly start to decline. Um, we anticipate by 2040 that it would decline about 8%. VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, is also a great correlation to our carbon dioxide emissions, our CO2, um, which translates to greenhouse gas emissions. So we would anticipate that through this investment portfolio, um, through the, um, that we would anticipate reducing greenhouse gas emissions by about 8% in 2040. And the uh, second to last piece here is I'm gonna talk about is environmental impact report. Um, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, looks at the Regional Transportation Plan as a project. So therefore, we have to uh, prepare an environmental impact report that looks at the various impacts and recommends mitigation measures throughout a variety of different topical areas. There's eight areas that the program 
level environmental impact looks at, aesthetics, agricultural resources, air quality, cultural and tribal resources, land use and population, greenhouse gases, and trans transportation circulation, just to name a few of those. Um, with that, there are um, two impacts that are identified. All other impacts in those topical areas can be mitigated for, um, but there are two that remain that we cannot mitigate for. Those are the conversion of farm and agricultural lands and greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Those impacts will remain significant and unavoidable throughout the plan. And the reason why they are is if we look at the first item, the conversion of farm agri agricultural lands, a lot of these projects uh, that we have in this plan are still um, at the preliminary stages. We don't exactly know the alignment, how wide they're going to be, or the scope of these projects. So it's a little difficult to really pinpoint how much farm or ag land will be used. Also, PCTPA nor the RTP um, has jurisdiction over mitigation requirements for those excuse me, individual projects. So therefore, those projects will have to go through further review, um, which will happen at the local level. And the last item is a greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, as I showed, VMT will increase by 27%. It will continue to increase on a, um, uh, on a total basis, which will be considered an impact. Um, there are mitigation measures that are identified in the environmental impact report in order to try to reduce the amount of single occupant vehicle travel, to look at trip chaining or other methods. Um, but overall, in the end, it will still be significant and unavoidable. And these two impacts are similar to what our prior plan identified um, with the 2036 RTP. And I'll wrap up here with our next steps uh, before we open this up to any questions or comments from the public. Um, our schedule, we've came to the board uh, many different times on our topical areas for our goals and objectives, our revenue projections, our project lists. Um, and we are now in our final stretch of our outreach efforts with the draft document. We anticipate wrapping up our um, public review period in the middle of October. At that point in time, we will review any of the comments that we've received, start making changes to our final regional transportation plan document and the environmental impact report, um, wrap that up for our December meeting. Um, the, the information will come out uh, November 22nd in time for that December 4th board action to adopt the RTP and certify the EIR. So with that, I appreciate your time and I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have or hear from the public. Uh, thank you for the clip notes uh, version. It was very uh, robust. Any questions or comments down below, uh, Amy? There you go. Um, I just, I, I, I am pretty sure this has taken place, but the coordination with RTPAs in counties with Eastern, within Eastern Placer County and making sure that large projects kind of within the Truckee North Tahoe area are within all of the, I know everyone's doing their updates now, you guys were the first, so mm -hmm. um, I just want to make sure on your, from your perspective, that coordination is happening and all of those projects are being um, kind of implemented into each of the um, RTPAs. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, from our perspective with the regional transportation plan, um, projects can be covered in one of multiple ways. One, it can be a specific project that's identified in a project list. Um, it can also be reflected through uh, goals or objectives um, or even different programs that are, could be identified in our plan. And I know that in the uh, resort triangle area, uh, there's a kickoff of the regional uh, the Resort Triangle Transportation Plan, the RTTP uh, for short, uh, that's looking at a number of um, future projects um, that haven't quite been defined yet. Um, and one example is that is the bus on shoulder pilot plan that uh, Placer County was wanting to operate on um, State Route 89 or 267. Um, and we do have a policy in there that talks about um, exclusive uh, use bus lanes on there. And that was really in reaction to um, that pilot plan that didn't have any definition to it. Um, the other thing also is we work with each of the city, uh, city staff, Placer County staff, in order to get those projects. So the more we know, the, the, the better we can incorporate uh, those into the plan. And we will have talked with uh, Placer County staff in the Tahoe region. Uh, just recently, Luke uh, McNeil cared met with staff up there to really kind of go through those details and coordinate those efforts with each of the other two our, um, RTPAs up there because it is such an interesting mix of, you know, this dumbbell where you have 
um, the massive populations on either side of Placer County, but services running in the middle. Um, so we, we anticipate we'll be able to accommodate you know, those future plans, projects, um, and once those do uh, come to fruition, they can easily be incorporated into the planning documents. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other comments, questions from? There you go. Sorry. That's all right. I just hesitate to reach down there and push the button. <laughs> Aaron, uh, I just want to make sure that, that I'm tracking you. Um, you're projecting greenhouse gas reductions of about 8% by 2040. Was that accurate? That's correct. Okay. And the goal set for uh, the greater Sacramento region by the state is a 19% reduction um, by the same time. I'm assuming the difference in achievability is the more rural nature of Placer County? That would be correct. If you were to go and pull out SACOG's uh, Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Communities strategy that they released, uh, was it Monday? So a few days ago. Um, it's actually a 60, 59 page read, um, much easier than it's ever been. So we, we have some work to do to get our pages limit down here. Um, but there are, are the, the appendices are probably as thick. And if you go to those appendices, there's going to be tables and there's going to be maps um, that will graphically show when you move out to more rural type area, suburban type area, the distance you have to travel to jobs, to um, your daily services does increase. Um, so we do have, as a starting point, a, a, a longer distance we have to travel for jobs out in Placer County. Um, so there, that's a primary function of that. Um, is that our VMT won't equal 19% as it would. And SACOG, when they look at 19%, it's in totality from all the different counties, um, all pitching in to try to hit that 19%. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, um, um, I was wondering if any of those projections or those numbers take into account any of the future expectation of transitioning to alternative fuels. They do. So when we look at the CO2 emissions, um, the CO2 emissions is based on um, a software that takes into account uh, the California Air Resources Board fleet mix. And in that fleet mix, they assume that over time, our vehicles are one, going to become more fuel efficient, and two, transition to alternative fuels. So that is, uh, that is included in there on that we are transitioning one to um, less uh, vehicles that pollute less, but then also um, looking at our land use and transportation mix and shorter trips. Um, and greater dependent or greater use of transit and walking and biking will play into that role. So does that include for um, civilian vehicles? That is, yeah. So when we talk about the CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas reductions, we're talking specifically about passenger and light duty vehicles or light duty trucks. We're not talking about the diesels. The diesels are covered under another plan. Um, trains and not, uh, trains and planes um, are covered underneath another plan at the state level, as well as stationary sources. Any other comments? Already, uh, anyone uh, in the audience wish to address the board on this workshop? Uh, seeing none, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It was well received. And now we will move to item J, I-80 State Route 65 Interstate Improvements Project Phase 1 Construction Completion. Mr. Luke mcneil Kerr. Morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board. I'm going to be giving a presentation, yes, on completion of construction of phase one of the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange. But I first want to just take a moment and uh, introduce some of the key folks that have been working on this project from Caltrans. Uh, we have Jeff Johnson, the construction project manager. Jeff? And uh, Rod Murphy, the uh, project manager of Caltrans, also. And I just want to say, these two folks have been in instrumental and in working very hard to make sure, one, that this project was delivered on budget, and also it was delivered four months ahead of schedule. So I really appreciate all their hard work, and they, uh, we owe them our thanks. Thank you. So, thank you, guys. Okay, um, so the overall project for the uh, interchange is to add one additional lane to each of the four connectors between Interstate 80 and State Route 65, and the total estimated cost is $450 million. We began the project study report that Caltrans completed in 2009, and then PCTPA secured both state and federal environmental clearance 
in September of 2016. And because of the cost, the project has been broken into four construction phases, and the phase one design was completed by Caltrans in June of 2017. So in 2012, the board directed staff to include northbound Highway 65 as part of the first phase of improving the interchange. And as shown here, the phase one project includes adding a third northbound lane on uh, Highway 65 from Interstate 80 up to Pleasant Grove Boulevard and improvements to the Galleria Boulevard Stamford Ranch Road interchange. And so we had a groundbreaking in December of 2017 on the phase one project. And we've already seen a direct economic benefit from the project as there was a hundred people on average working on the construction uh, per day. And this is a photo of uh, when construction started. You can see underneath Highway 65, just north of Interstate 80, the 12 new columns that were being constructed for the new third lane on the left side there. And this is a more recent photo with the widening of Highway 65 actually completed. And you can see those new columns. Each one of those columns required a hole to be dug that was 100 feet, feet deep and 13 feet wide. And then uh, the columns above them are about 60 feet in height. And here is a photo of construction of the widening uh, once the columns were completed. And this project actually included 3.5 million pounds of steel and 12,000 cubic yards of concrete. Oops, go back here. Uh, with any large infrastructure project, there's, of course, a lot of dust and noise. And as you can see in the photos here, we have several apartment complexes that are very close to the project. And so we worked with Caltrans to try and minimize the impacts to these residents. I will say they were uh, very patient and understanding for the most part. And uh, we wanted to show our appreciation, so we invited all of the residents, uh, and, and Kathleen and Sol, we actually walked door to door in some cases, uh, to give them a VIP package uh, to the Hot Chili Cool Cars event that, attend that occurred last Saturday. And then uh, more on a multimodal aspect, the Antelope Creek uh, bike trail did need to be closed just for public safety during the construction. And I'm happy to report that in mid-September, the uh, bike trail was reopened to the public. So I wanna walk through a series of uh, aerial photos here. Uh, we're gonna be starting, uh, this is looking north on Highway 65, uh, starting at Interstate 80 and then working up towards Pleasant Grove Boulevard. And this is actually at the start of construction. And you can see the merge from westbound Interstate 80 merging with northbound Highway 65. And that's where traffic was really backing up on Interstate 80 in both directions. And we had a major safety issue where 13 fatalities occurred in six years along these two corridors. And this is a more recent photo of the third lane actually constructed. And you can see the merge area is now eliminated and that westbound uh, ramp from Interstate 80 now goes into its own lane. And you can also see the extra wide shoulder there on the right. And that is actually planning ahead for the future. Uh, we didn't wanna go back out and disturb those uh, residents again. And so we actually constructed an extra wide shoulder for the future improvements and that westbound ramp from Interstate 80 in the, in the ultimate interchange is planned to be two lanes. And we were actually, as we move further north here on Highway 65 towards Galleria Boulevard and Stanford Ranch Road, we're actually able to use that extra wide shoulder. And if you travel over the uh, bridge structure, you'll see it opens up to four lanes halfway across. And that allows us to carry three lanes all the way up to Pleasant Grove Boulevard. You can see here, we've also added a two lane off ramp at, to Stanford Ranch Road, Galleria Boulevard. And then on the southbound side, we've improved the southbound on ramp and added a ramp meter and two meter lanes and the carpool bypass lane. And then as we travel up the Stanford Ranch uh, Road off-ramp here, we've signalized that off-ramp, very similar to the other side on the southbound side with Galleria, and that's eliminated that high-speed weave for people trying to get over to Costco and Five Star Drive. It seems to work very well. I've heard a lot of compliments um, on, 
on how this has improved uh, along this corridor. You can also see we've added three uh, lanes on Stanford Ranch Road and two left turn lanes on a northbound Highway 65. And if you recall, traffic in those left turn lanes used to back up all the way to the Galleria Mall entrance. And so this has significantly improved the local roadway as well. And then here's a photo of the northbound on-ramp. This has been uh, improved to add a ramp meter, add two meter lanes, and a carpool bypass lane also. And then as we travel up uh, Highway 65 towards Pleasant Grove Boulevard, the three lanes continue up to Pleasant Grove Boulevard and connect with the existing two-lane on -ramp. <coughs> Excuse me. So we had a ribbon cutting um, back on Thursday, September 5th. And we had well over 100 people there. Many of you were there. And then the project officially opened to the public on Saturday, September 7th. So throughout the project, uh, we've been doing both Caltrans and PCTPA providing uh, information to the public. Caltrans has been providing more of the day-to-day -day information. There's about an email distribution list of 1,200 people that got updates on um, detours and traffic congestion conditions and then PCTPA has been doing the quarterly updates and we actually have our latest video uh, to show you. Hello, my name is Mike Lucan, Executive Director of Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, and today we are celebrating the completion of Phase 1 of the Interstate 80 Highway 65 Interchange Project. As of September 2019, construction is now finished on the first phase of the Interstate 80 Highway 65 Interchange. The construction that has been completed includes the addition of a third lane on Highway 65 from Interstate 80 to Pleasant Grove Boulevard and signalizing of the off-ramp at Stanford Ranch Road, Galleria Boulevard from Highway 65. The first phase of the Interstate 80 Highway 65 Improvements Project will bring congestion relief and better access to South Placer Region. This is the first step in improving not only the access for local businesses, jobs and residences, but it is also the first step to improving the quality of life in Placer County. Hi, I'm Alyssa Stillhigh. I'm a member of Lincoln City Council. I was elected in November of 2018. Both I-80 and Highway 65 serve as integral transportation corridors to the South Placer region's burgeoning economy. According to 2016 employment report conducted in South Placer County, more than 1,100 new businesses were opened in the last 10 years, resulting in nearly 13,000 jobs. Between 2012 and 2016 alone, nearly 25,000 new jobs were created in the region. Over this period, wages were shown to increase about 5% every year. The initial improvements on the Interstate 80 and Highway 65 interchange will provide significant benefits to the South Placer region's business community by improving traffic congestion on the Highway 65 corridor. My name is Julia Drefke, and I am the Director of Government Relations at Adventist Health here in Roseville. Adventist Health is an integrated health system serving more than 80 communities with clinics and hospitals across the West Coast and Hawaii. We have been based in Roseville since 1985 and are the sixth largest employer in Roseville. By the mid 2000s, our company was growing and needed to expand in order to keep our employees at a central location. We had employees in several office spaces across Roseville and understood the benefits to our employees if we were consolidated into one building. While the Highway 65 corridor offered many advantages, given its proximity to many of the communities that we serve, the traffic congestion made it a poor choice. We were concerned how that traffic would not only impact the daily commute for our employees, but also how it would impact access to healthcare for our employees. In the end, we decided against locating along the Highway 65 corridor. Whether a business is established and looking to expand or relocate, or just starting out and deciding where to build its foundation, you can bet they're considering Placer County as one of their potential new locations. A strong transportation network is a vital part of running a successful business. It consists of convenience, access to businesses and activity centers, in addition to efficient roads and highways that are safe for all modes of transportation. The I-80 Highway 65 interchange is one of the key parts of our transportation network. 
The completion of the first phase of improvements will help reduce congestion in the area and get our residents to and from work safely. As Placer County economy continues to grow, transportation network must grow with it. We must provide our employers and employees with the tools necessary to not just function, but to prosper. Future funding for the remainder of the I-80-65 Interchange Improvements Project and Highway 65 Widening Project will help pave the way for future development and economic growth in Placer County. A small investment today will have great returns in the future when our region is able to thrive. Hi, I'm Holly Andriotta, member of the Lincoln City Council, and I was elected in November of 2018. The Interstate 80 Highway 65 interchange was designed over 30 years ago. And since then, the population in Placer County has doubled. Because of this, the freeway can no longer accommodate the 200,000 plus vehicles that use it daily. Many of the businesses located along the I-80 and SR-65 corridors offer entry-level employment opportunities for our young adults. Proposed improvements will not only increase transportation safety for these younger travelers, but will also provide better access to local jobs. Fixing these traffic challenges will not only help us, but our future generations as well. Hi, I'm Rockland City Council Member Bill Halden. And hi, I'm Rockland City Council Member Ken Broadway. The completion of the first phase of the Interstate 80 Highway 65 interchange improvements will reduce congestion in South Placer, specifically at the Stanford Ranch off-ramp. Installing traffic signals at this off-ramp will reduce the likelihood of collisions and create a free flow of traffic into the Rockland businesses along Five Star Boulevard, along with Destiny Community Center and Destiny Church. Every morning during the school year, traffic backs up on eastbound Interstate 80 at Rockland Road. Sierra College, one of Rockland's major employers and incubator of the region's future business owners and provider of workforce training in Placer County, is located adjacent to the interchange off Rockland Road. Relieving congestion to the college and other businesses along Rockland Road will allow for a safe route to school for students, for Rockland residents east of Interstate 80, and employees of the college. We need to provide auxiliary lanes on eastbound Interstate 80, upgrade the Rockland Road interchange, and widen Rockland Road east of Interstate 80. These major projects in Rockland lack a local match to get state and federal funding. This first phase is great, and we will continue to identify ways to fund additional improvements to this interchange and widen Highway 65 all the way to Lincoln. Okay. All righty. Thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah, that's and of course, we're already starting to think about phase two, which is to reconfigure the two lane loop ramp with a three lane direct connect flyover. And of course, design starting on that is contingent on finding uh, construction funding. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Please, anybody have any comments or questions or congratulations? Or I'll just say I had the opportunity to speak at the recent Hot Chili Cool Cars, and it was quite enjoyable to have an entire group of residents in the front. When we started talking about it, and I asked about the impact, and they started cheering. Uh, clearly, it's had an impact. I've attended a few luncheons the past two weeks, and when I talk about our role here as the board and what you gentlemen have done, thank you, and what this team has done, I'm constantly receiving kudos for the improvements. It's clearly recognized. I let them know that we have a lot of work to do. So now that we've got this phase behind us, now the real hard work begins and uh, we've got a lot of work to continue. So thank you everyone for what you've done. But the residents of Placer County and uh, Rockland specifically uh, really appreciate all the hard work. So again, thank you. Yeah, as a frequent traveler, uh, thanks for taking one thing off my to-do list. Uh, as I come home uh, from downtown Sacramento, I always had to make that decision whether I was going to go Riverside or take the, uh, take the uh, interchange. Other than uh, it's been flawless. Um, now I just have to learn how to merge from uh, that Stanford Ranch uh, 
portion as I weave my way over to Pleasant Grove, but wow, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it just stress-free. So nice job. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. On time, under budget, I thought, but. Uh, on budget, four months ahead of schedule. Yeah. Well, that's kind of <laughs> under budget too, right? Yeah. Time is money. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh. I just yeah. want to say um, thank you very much um, on a safety standpoint. Um, unfortunately, losing lives is a horrible thing, but making this um, very needed improvement is amazing. And I was at the ribbon cutting and, you know, saw the CHP people there and talking about how, you know, they don't have to worry as much get, getting ambulances and fire, fire departments um, where they need to go. And so on a safety standpoint, Loomis faces some similar situations on our, our interstate um, on ramp. And so just kudos. Thank you so much for saving and helping save in future lives. Jamie, did you have a? No. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Mr. Chairman, maybe there's one last thing. I, I know he's very modest and humble, um, but uh, the person sitting next to me here, uh, our deputy director, has been tirelessly working on this project his entire time at PCTPA. And so I just wanted to say a little special thank you to Luke and, and, uh, and his efforts uh, to make this project uh, arrive at where we see it today. Thank you, and uh, his efforts have not gone unnoticed. <laughs> And it make, makes my life uh, a little easier, as Bruce was saying, every time I have to go into the wonderful city of Rockland. <laughs> <laughs> or on my way to Roseville. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's early in the morning, you know, it's 7.30, quarter to 8, I always had to make that decision. Am I going to go to Sunset and go down that way or Commerce? And that, I don't have to make that decision anymore. So, uh, because, uh, you know, the traffic was backing up into on the 80, so. It's really uh, well well received, and uh, kudos to everyone. Thank you, gentlemen, for your work doing that. So we're very appreciative. So when do we start on the next phase? <laughs> as soon as we have some funding to do, to do uh, so. Um, right. The other thing is we will be closely monitoring the interchange uh, in the in the coming weeks and months to see uh, as people return to that northbound from their shortcuts on sunset yeah, yeah. And, and other roadways to see what the path traffic patterns and how those are changing and and so we'll report back to you on what we what we see is happening out there uh, as well as we we'd, we'd love to get your feedback as we move forward to see how how, how things are going to change um, they don't always change immediately people's driving habits they get used to driving one way and it takes some time to come back so very good thank you is there anyone in the audience that wants to make a comment about this seeing none thank you very much uh, now we'll move to item K the executive director's report yes sir uh, thank you uh, mr. chairman and members of the board um, uh, have have a, a, a number of things to cover in my report uh, this month um, but first I wanted to, to introduce our our newest staff member to PCTPA uh, Ed Schofield uh, has come and joined our, our team and uh, Ed's in the audience today Ed's going to be working on uh, some uh, on a part-time basis on on some of our um, transit related projects that are priorities for our, our uh, agency and so uh, he, he comes from a, a rich background in transit working many years um, uh, for uh, San Joaquin transit initially and then for Sacramento Regional Transit uh, Ed also lives in the community, uh, makes his home with his family in Granite Bay, and so uh, so he's part of our community and has been for a long time. So I just welcome him. And he comes from a family of public servants. Uh, I served with his father, uh, Ed Schofield Sr., uh, on the uh, Rural County Representatives of California and uh, um, CSAC. And he's a good, very nice gentleman. <laughs> Already, yeah. all right. So, in my in my uh, normal course of items, I, I like to talk to you today. I debated uh, quite a bit this morning over uh, to to talk about the the good news first or the bad news first. And so, uh, I think I'll start with the not so great news, and then and then end with some, you know, normal or or, or better news. And so, a couple things I wanted to mention to you today, and and that is, uh, and you've heard a lot about it in the press in the last couple of days, is the safe rule. Uh, this is a rule uh, that uh, 
basically the federal government is imposing new fuel standards um, for vehicles and it has a great impact on what we do here at PCTPA and at SACOG and, and uh, it's, it's, it has some far reaching implications. Um, as you know, the SAFE rule, uh, it was announced that it was going to be enacted last week um, by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, we immediately saw the uh, uh, 22 and now 23 states, um, including California, file a lawsuit against the Environmental Protection Agency um, for the enaction of this rule. Um, the, uh, we, I spent most of the day yesterday with um, all of the, the COG, the executive directors for all the COGs in the state of California, uh, as well as the leaders of Caltrans, Federal Highways, uh, the Attorney General's Office, and the California Resources Board uh, talking about this at length and its, its far-reaching implications. And uh, there, are, there is um, uh, not, not a, a lot of great news coming out of this. One is that there will be no temporary injunction filed by the Attorney General's Office. And what that means is that uh, the lawsuit will go to the end of when it is either settled, uh, hopefully, be, uh, or when it is finally adjudicated. Uh, and likely that uh, a final adjudication would happen by the U.S. Supreme Court, so it's going to take a number of years uh, if it goes that full length. Um, so there will be no request that this rule not go into effect uh, while the lawsuit is being uh, 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 enacted or while it's being um, uh, adjudicated. And so uh, that means that it is going to affect, going to go into effect, and it is going to affect the way we, that we do business. Um, we already know, and as we reported, that it, it uh, in terms of future air quality plans, it puts those in question. Um, it, um, uh, you know, we can go ahead as, as, as we talked about this morning with our RTP process. Uh, we don't need to delay the, the, the uh, uh, adoption of that, but um, our RTP process folds into SACOG's uh, MTP process, and so SACOG's MTP um, it, it's still being uh, assessed, but it likely the final adoption of the MTP and SCS will probably be delayed um, because of this uh, uncertainty posed by uh, this legal challenge. Um, and why that is is because they have to read. It's not so much the fuel standards; those those are what they are, and and the federal government and the and the 23 states will have to decide, you know, what what fuel standard to use, but the, the the critical part for us is that those fuel standards are part of our air quality analysis. So as, as Aaron mentioned earlier today, we do a very elaborate air analysis um, based upon land use and transportation and a number of other things for the metropolitan region. And then that feeds into a state implementation plan. And really that this whole fuel standards, that's a base assumption of those air plans. And literally, you know, we're at the end of completing that analysis, and we will have to start over again. And that process can take up to two years uh, to do that analysis under the best of circumstances. And so, um, so, and, and then we don't really know what, because of the lawsuit's being adjudicated, we don't you know what standard to use. So it's it's a very difficult uh, situation. And then lastly, uh, probably the. Uh, the, the real uh, unexpected um, item was a letter that, that, w that uh, was reported in the Sacramento Bee yesterday that we all received a copy of from the Environmental Protection Agency again, and they are actually moving to invalidate our existing air quality plan. Um, and that has real immediate implications on virtually every project that's in the MTIP. And it's not just federally funded projects or state funded projects, it's even locally funded projects. So if you have a project in your community that's, that's um, funded by a traffic impact fee plan only, but it's in the MTIP because it relies on the MTIP for its error analysis, it is put into question. Um, what we don't know right now today is what is the timeline of impact. And so we'll be reporting back to you and working very closely with SACOG and our jurisdictions to really look at what is the timeline of that impact. Um, we've never really been in this situation, especially this, this last uh, move by the EPA to invalidate a plan. Um, frankly, the delay in, in that, that uh, it was actually the EPA that was um, still reviewing that plan and they put into question a, a plan that 
hasn't been approved, but it's because they haven't approved it. So it's it's a it's a new new uh, thing that we haven't ever run up against before. Um, so so that's that's um, and I'm sorry to bring to you some some news and some uncertainty with our projects. Um, but we will be in constant communication with you all, um, probably even between meetings, um, to let you know what impact this has. Uh, we'll be working with the technical advisory committee, the TAC, the public work staffs from the from the city, cities and the county, and uh, and SACOG very very closely over the over the next um, well foreseeable future to see how this impacts uh, us and how we move forward. So. Any questions on that before I move forward? Any questions? Okay. Okay, now how about the good news? Oh, yeah. well, one more little bit of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> one more one more little, ch another challenge, and that is um, the uh, the uh, legislature, um, as, as pre also previously reported, um, uh, is taking a look at the use of um, Transportation Development Act fundings or local transportation funds. And those funds are used uh, in communities for both, um, uh, well, primarily, first and foremost, for public transit. And then uh, if a jurisdiction, jurisdiction meets its unmet transit needs process, it then can be used for a number of other uh, priority items, including streets and roads and other um, alternative modes of transportation in our county. Um, uh, makes great use of that local control and, and puts money aside for transit, but then it, it utilizes those funds uh, for a variety of different things. And so the TDA, uh, the legislature and this task force that they set up through the California Transit Association uh, is looking at two things. One is, and one is very needed, it's a, a, a relook at the whole fare box return ratio, which is how much fare box money we get back and how that applies. and and. It's a very antiquated law that was enacted in the early 70s and really needs a fix and, and new performance uh, measures. That's not really the problem. The problem uh, lies in that, that, that at the same time they also want to take a look at um, reducing the local control over the TDA funds after transit has been paid for. Um, and so that's something that, that gives us great concern here in Placer County because we, again, use this for a number of other uh, projects uh, throughout our community. And so we're working very closely with um, uh, the lobbyist team for the county, uh, Placer County um, lobbyist, uh, our lobbyist, uh, Mark Watts, and, uh, and uh, Gonzalez and Sons, the lobbyist for uh, the city of Roseville likely to form a coalition of other like communities that have the same concern and hopefully uh, retain that local control um, over those LTF funds. And, uh, and if, if that is not achievable, to look at some type of phase out program so that it doesn't immediately impact our communities. So, so that's something, uh, again, we'll keep, keep you very much in the loop on, as well as the TAC in the cities and the county. So now to on to some brighter news, and that is uh, our funding strategy, which is is working uh, uh, through the process on two again on two fronts. Uh, one is uh, Assembly Bill 1413. Uh, we're happy to report, uh, as most of you know already, uh, through through other channels that uh, that is now on the governor's desk. It's been enrolled and engrossed, um, and and the it, the governor is in the process of considering uh, whether or not to sign that bill. Uh, our our uh, team is working uh, and literally uh, leaving no rock unturned um, to try to convince the governor that this is a uh, a worthwhile measure. This um, measure, as you know, was uh, concentrated down into three counties, so it's now a pilot project as as opposed to a county or a statewide uh, endeavor. And so those counties being San Diego County, Solano County. Uh, and Placer County, and so we are going to be one of three counties that they're going to try this out on. Um, they did, uh, as, as the project was approved by the Senate, did change one very important aspect of the uh, Assembly Bill 1413, and that was to uh, impose a uh, requirement that you either include all of the unincorporated area in, a in one of these three counties uh, or none of the unincorporated area, and, uh, and that would be added to what are termed contiguous cities and so why they pick these three counties is they have three areas of contiguous cities so 
In the case of Placer County, that's um, ultimately going to be the decision of, of you all in terms of what the unincorporated area is going to be included or not. But at this uh, you know early stage, we we likely will make a recommendation to you to in not include any of the unincorporated area. Um, however, we did get a very important portion of the bill um, uh, included, and that is a nexus um, provision. And that nexus provision is very, very key to us and, and those other two counties because it allows us to imp uh, basically implement our full expenditure plan, as you have seen um, uh, and, and adopted preliminarily uh, at prior meetings. And so anything that ties back to the contiguous cities essentially can be funded. Um, and, and so that, that keeps our, our expenditure plan intact. Now we are going to go back and take a look at the implications on revenue. Um, HDL, our, our um, sales tax consultant, that's also the counties and Rockland's sales tax consultant, works very closely with Roseville sales tax consultant, Muni Services, and, uh, and the, the finance directors of all the jurisdictions. And uh, we're going to do a refresh on our, our uh, our sales tax revenue preliminary indications uh, basically uh, uh, um, are that it won't have a very large impact at all. Um, but we we uh, don't operate on anecdotal information. We are going to go through and redo that analysis. The other thing that we're going to have them look at is is there still remains a question of um, and for lack of a better term a fairness um, discussion about is it fair that people in the unincorporated area and these new growth areas don't don't pay the fee, but people in the incorporated areas do pay that fee. And so we're going to ask HDL to do a little bit of analysis on a per capita basis um, so that we may need to, uh, so that we can possibly make some adjustments um, to, uh, to planned revenue shifts that we had, had uh, uh, forecast already. As you know, we plan to um, uh, shift some TDA funding with our proposed district to those areas that are not going to be in the district. Um, one potential uh, method might be that we don't shift some of those funds because the unincorporated area is not generating funds um, uh, uh, from those developments. So that's some that's an idea of some of the things we'd look at. That isn't necessarily the, the method, but just an example of one things that we'll be working on in the coming weeks and, and bringing back to you. In terms of our outreach strategy, I, I guess maybe I'll stop again. And is there any questions on 14? Any questions on the legislation? No, you're doing good. Okay. Uh, lastly, what I want to report on is is our outreach, and uh, we've been doing lots of stuff. Uh, is is uh, uh, as you probably have noticed, the electronic billboards, seven of them in the South County, uh, have been filled with our messages in terms of uh, uh, attract or uh, directing people to our website uh, keepplastermoving.com to find out more information and, and about the needs analysis for for that um, uh, we've gotten literally hundreds of thousands of impressions um, from folks that's also tied to a, a thing uh, that when you pass by those that actually uh, rebroadcasts um, things on your smartphone so so when you go by one of those message boards it knows and it, it, it tells your smartphone, hey, uh, I'll send you another message to make sure that you check out Um uh, So that's being uh, implemented. Uh, so on the social media front, we're, we're hitting uh, all uh, avenues of social media um, uh, through a number of, of things I won't delve into, but, but again, getting uh, literally tens of thousands of hits on our different sources. Uh, and uh, and then a new thing that's going to be starting up here very soon is we're going to be in uh, in literally all of the movie theaters in the county from now through uh, the holidays. Uh, you won't be able to go see a movie uh, in South Placer County uh, at any theater um, without seeing uh, uh, one of our videos uh, about uh, our efforts. And so uh, there'll be a, a 90 second version of that video before every movie you see. So. Um, so you may be getting very tired of seeing that video by the by by, by the end of the holidays. Um, we're also hosting uh, uh, and sponsoring a number of events. We uh, participated in Roseville Splash a couple weeks ago, um, and, uh, and as Luke mentioned, uh, Rockland Hot Chili Cool Cars this past weekend. We are uh, going to be at Lincoln's uh, Showcase event uh, this coming weekend. 
uh, as well as the Hot Pink Fun Run uh, as a sponsorship for that and the Roseville State of the City. So those are some of the events that are upcoming that we're, again, trying to get the word out and feed people to our um, message avenues, i.e. the website, to learn more about our effort and the importance of our effort. Um, we are uh, in uh, the middle of uh, our emergency uh, r response study um, that we commissioned uh, our fair and peers, our traffic consultant, to take a look at from 10 locations throughout the county what is the impact of, of doing all the improvements and the expenditure plan that we, we estimate. So from, from virtually every place uh, uh, or every area in, Pla in South Placer County, what will be the difference in time to get to a hospital um, uh, i.e. Kaiser and Sutter um, uh, with and without our improvements and, and preliminary indications uh, of the, that analysis are that there will be a significant um, difference. Um, so a little preview on that. Uh, we are doing focus groups, uh, again, to check in our messages here in late October. Um, we're scheduled uh, with the contract amendment with FM3 to do polling in January and March. Uh, uh, a January uh, a check in to, and readjustment, and then March right after the primary election, which will be that will be the f the final amount of data that you will have going into April um, to make a decision, uh, as well as the other um, city councils uh, in the uh, in the county to make a decision whether or not uh, this endeavor is worthwhile to move forward into uh, into a uh, putting this on the ballot. Uh, and, and along those lines, uh, we, uh, we are working on a master schedule um, for um, all of those meetings that we're going to be having from March through May. Uh, and we will present that to you likely at the next uh, meeting or two. Uh, it is going to be a very, very busy schedule um, to get through all of the city, the South Placer County City Councils. Uh, and our board and so uh, uh, I'll, I'll start now by asking your your patience and and uh, participation in that effort um, it's going to be a pretty intense time this this spring um, and then um, that is about all I have to report today okay so any questions comments to our executive director already We'll now move to board direction to staff. Uh, is there any direction from staff members, board members? I have none. Uh, there are some informational <coughs> items for you to use. And our next scheduled PCTPA board meeting and all the others is October 23rd, 2019 at 9 a.m. Thank you for your participation and cooperation. Thank you. Thank you.